Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 23 of the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. This week, we're going to be covering ventricular rhythms. My name is Brian Wallace. I'm the host and creator here at Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. And over at the website, you can find all the notes on uh, for each and every one of these shows. Uh, season two, I have things a little bit more uh, well organized. So if you head over to www.physicianassistantexamreview.com and in the upper right hand corner, uh, I think there's a menu that says blueprint. Click on that um, and that'll drop everything down. And it's, it's much more clear with season two. That's one of the things I really wanted to address as I re- re- sort of restarted through the material. Um, what else? For this show, uh, you may hear a little bit of background noise. Hopefully not, but I've got the windows open. The sun is shining. It is April 2nd as I'm recording this, and it has done nothing but rain, <laughs> rain, rain, rain. Uh, so the fact that it's 50 degrees out and the sun's out, um, I've got the windows open. So you may hear some passing cars and things. Uh, you know, hopefully we'll filter those out. But if, if it's a little louder than normal, then that's, that's the reason for it. Uh, okay, so this week what we want to do is start covering ventricular rhythms. We've been covering arrhythmias uh, for the fa- past few sessions. This stuff can get confusing and bogged down, and I know in an audio program it's easily bogged down, uh, so I've split it up quite a bit. Uh, so we've done arrhythmias in general. We've done a normal sinus rhythm. We've talked about uh, rates and things and P waves and QRS waves and how it looks with a, a supraventricular rhythm with a narrow QRS and the P wave in front. For most of those, unless it gets lost in like an A-flutter or an A-fib where it disappears completely. Uh, And then we've talked about the SA nodes, how that uh, has the normal firing rates and controls the heart. We've talked about the AV node and how that transmits the signal down through to the ventricles and and sort of how that will work. So we've covered a good chunk of this. And today we're going to move into the lower half of the heart, the ventricles. We're going to talk about some of the issues you get with uh, ventricular rhythms. And we'll go from there. So let's start off with some of our uh, priming questions. Here we go. The first one, what is the normal firing rate for the AV node? Remember, so if we just have AV node firing and no SA node firing, no signal from above, how, hard, how fast will the heart beat? It's 40 to 60 beats per minute. What's the treatment for V-fib? Treatment for V-fib. Defibrillation. Uh, how about the treatment for torsades de pointes? For sods, what's the treatment? The treatment is magnesium. Um, if you haven't been with me for very long, these tests, these opening questions help prime the brain, help get you ready to remember the material we're going to cover. I'll cover these answers. Don't worry about that. But I need you to stop and think. This is an, this is, <laughs> the idea here is this is an active review. This is not just passively listening. Now, I know you're not uh, completely focused on this. I know that you're driving your car. I know that you're uh, out for a jog, all those sorts of things. That doesn't mean you completely disengage. That means you're still here. You're still part of the show. You're still thinking as I cover this material. So what you're looking for is where we cover the treatment for V-fib and where we co- cover the treatment for des- tersades. And you're recalling and you're using your brain to remember where, how often the AV node will fire it if it is uh, not acted upon by an outside source. Can you answer all three of those now? <laughs> Even though I just gave you the answer, were you paying enough attention? All right, so we're going to jump off with the idea of ventricular rhythms today, uh, wide QRS complexes, and no preceding P wave, right? The P wave is the atrial contraction, that little P wave that comes before the ventral- ventricular contraction, the QRS complex. So there's no preceding P wave, and there's a wide QRS. Some of this stuff is hard to get your head around. Uh, I know it took me a long time to really get EKGs and understand how they look and how they function. It, as I do with everything, it's important to understand the basics, to understand the underlying themes and understanding why a P wave occurs, why a why QRS occurs, why it would be wide versus narrow, those sorts of things, and where it occurs uh, wide versus narrow. So all of our supraventricular beats, supraventricular beats have narrow QRSs. All of our ventricular uh, arrhythmias have wide QRSs, right? So knowing that kind of stuff is the framework, the basis for understanding the whole thing. Premature ventricular contractions are first, and a PVC is just an extra beat originating in one of the ventricles. So you have normal beats all over the place, you know, normal uh, rate and rhythm, and then suddenly there's just a wide QRS complex ventricular beat out of nowhere. Boom. 
That's a PVC, a premature ventricular contraction. They're pretty common. Um, I'm pretty sure I get them about once a week or so. I don't think there's a lot of underlying issues. I just get a little feeling like, uh, almost like I have to clear my throat or cough a little bit or something, uh, and then it's gone. It's just it's just one short, almost like uh, what they refer to it as a skipped beat. You feel sort of a little uncomfortable and then it's gone. Uh, that's a PVC. There's no P wave there. And again, it's a wide QRS. So it's a very obvious ventricular beat in amongst a bunch of normal uh, beats. Some terminology to go along with PVCs, uh, you can get bite by Gemini. Is a PVC every other beat? So it's one normal beat followed by a PVC repeated continuously. So that obviously feels a little more uncomfortable uh, if you get by Gemini. So it's a, a normal beat, then a PVC, then a normal beat, then a PVC. You can get a trigemini which is a PVC every third beat. So two normal beats followed by a PVC repeated continuously. So uh, normal beat, normal beat, PVC, normal beat, normal beat, PVC. Uh, and those are, so those are two possibilities for continuous uh, PVCs. You can get unifocal PVCs and multifocal PVCs. So this is obviously uh, an obvious difference here as we've been talking about uh, AFib and the, vers the, the difference between AFib and a flutter and how all of that works and how the signals originate in different sources. Same thing here. A unifocal PVC will originate from the same source. So there's a particular myocytes uh, in the ventricle that are super excited and they are just ready to go. So you get a PVC from that one location. And the way that you know it's from one location is you're looking at your EKG uh, and it looks the same in every single beat. So you get these very similar beats, right? So you get a PVC that looks exactly the same every time it fires. Those complexes look exactly the same. In a multifocal PVC, the PVC originate at different places within the ventricle. So we've got different areas firing at different points. So you might get a PVC from the left vent from an area of the left ventricle, then you get a PVC from an area in the right ventricle. Well, now our QRS complexes are going to look different, right? They're going to be all over the place, kind of like our uh, a fib and a flutter when we get different looking uh, constantly changing EKGs it's because it's, it's the focal point where it's coming from is a different source so the electricity travels in a little bit different direction so our EKGs look very very different when it's a multifocal issue uh, as opposed to a unifocal issue alright so deep breath we just ran through some terms bigemini PVC every other beat trigemini PVC every third beat Unifocal means they're all, all those PVCs are coming from the same group of myocytes. Multifocal means they're coming from all different groups of myocytes all around the heart. Our clinical presentation, like I said before, uh, people will come in saying that they have a, a few like skipped heartbeats or palpitations or something just kind of feels funny in their chest. Maybe a little cough. Maybe they need to like clear their throat a little bit uh, from time to time. That's what you're. That's the kind of the description you're looking at. Your ECG, like we said, is a wide QRS complex. We're going to have no preceding P waves. And then a compensatory pause before the next beat. So it takes a second for all of the uh, ventricles to repolarize. So there's a little bit of a pause, and then a normal beats occur. These should be very, very clear and very easy to pick out on ECG. Now, uh, the problem is that they don't happen all the time, right? So they occur infrequently in here and there. Like I said, I'm pretty sure it happens to me and has happened for a long time. But it, it's, you know, I'll get them a couple times in a week, maybe, and then I won't even, then I'll forget about it. And then months later, it'll happen again. Uh, it doesn't seem to be related to stress or anything else. I just sort of notice it from time to time. So an ECG that I had done on me right now, for example, or whenever, isn't going to show this. It almost, you know, you're looking at such a small window, it's never going to pick it up. So something we can use, I don't, I can't remember if we've talked about this before or not, is a halter monitor. Halter monitor is like an ECG that you wear 24 hours a day, uh, and it can be left on to record. Um, I think usually record it for a day or two, uh, then bring it in and review it. And obviously in a situation like this where it's sort of random when it occurs, you can get a much better uh, picture. You might have a better chance of capturing it. You might not, but you have a better chance of capturing that that uh, PVC or that uh, or that arrhythmia in general, any arrhythmia. So we may do an ECG, we're gonna do an ECG, you're gonna do a halter monitor if you can't detect it and the patient's still complaining, and an electrolyte panel will help because any imbalance in electrolytes is obviously can cause an issue uh, with arrhythmias. Treatment, uh, really no treatment necessary for most asymptomatic cases. So even if my, if what I do have is PVCs from time to time, there's nothing to do that's not concerning. Doesn't mean I have an underlying issue. Uh, it just sort of happens, no big deal. If there is an uh, electrolyte imbalance, you're gonna wanna correct for that. 
And if the patient is asymptomatic, uh, beta, blo beta blockers are going to be your first line. So we're going to build from PVCs into ventricular tachycardia. So again, stop and think before I tell you, what is our ECG going to look like for ventricular tachycardia? What's our QRS complex going to look like? What's our P wave situation going to look like? We're going to have a wide QRS. So all of these are going to be wide QRS and no P wave. Pretty straightforward. Simple, right? Ventricular tachycardia. Our rate's going to be like 160 to 140. And, or I'm sorry, 160 to 240. Sorry, my headphones are cutting in and out. So, and that's going to be our ventricular VTAC. Uh, a run of three or more PVCs is considered VTAC. So if it's not a PVC and then a normal beat, PVC, normal beat, if it's three beats of PVCs in a row, we call that VTAC. And again, this can be polymorphic or unifocal. Either way is, is so multi, uh, multi I'm trying to find, <laughs> find the one I used before. Um, so if it's multifocal, it's another term for that is polymorphic. Polymorphic means that it looks different, right? We have different... Um, uh, different types of ECG findings for a polymorphic, like multifocal, it's the same thing. It means that the, it, the, the electrical signal is originating from a different spot in the heart, so it's going to look different. It's going to be a little bit different beat. So we have either unifocal or polymorphic beats uh, for our VTAC. Sustained, uh, a couple of definitions here. We have sustained VTAC, which is ventricular tachycardia that lasts for more than 30 seconds. Sustained is more than 30 seconds unsustained is less than 30 seconds. Pretty straightforward. And then pulseless VTAC. The each ECG shows VTAC. However, cardiac output has fallen so low that it does not create a palpable pulse. So this is a pulseless VTAC. So usually, ventricular tachycardia, the ventricle is beating super fast. And you might be thinking, well, he said that the AV node could only do 40 to 60 beats per minute. How come we're, we're running up so high now to 160 beats a minute? Well, because it's not coming through the AV node, right? These signals are being created not from the AV node, but from tissue within, with, from myocytes within the heart itself. I'm sorry, within the ventricles themselves. It's not coming down through the AV node. The AV node would regulate a little bit and slow down that rate. But this is coming directly from the ventricles. So if we get this where it's beating so fast, that the ventricles aren't filling up with blood and aren't pushing out enough blood, you can get to a point where you've got a pulseless VTAC. Because remember, if we're not giving them time to fill, there's nothing for them to push out. I'm not going to go through all of uh, cardiac physiology because I don't remember most of it, um, but you also don't need it here. Just understand that at some point, the pumping action of the heart is it just doesn't isn't working. You got uh, you have VTAC, so this ventricular rhythm super fast but it's not actually pushing out any, any blood to the body. So you get a pulseless VTAC. Risk factors here include previous myocardial infarction. So you get some damaged tissue that will make it irritable and allow it to, in some cases, shoot out that, those signals early. Clinical presentation. Uh, these patients also may be asymptomatic, but they may be all the way up through palpitations, chest pain, syncope, dizziness, uh, symptoms of poor cerebral perfusion. Again, if we're not getting enough blood passing through to the brain, you can get a look like a, appear like a stroke, uh, all kinds of different presentations here. Labs and studies, we sort of ran through our ECG earlier, uh, a rate of 160 to 240 is pretty normal, wide QRS complexes, no visible P waves. So how are we going to treat these people? What are we going to do for them? Well, you first have a couple of questions before you jump right into um, the options, you need to know how they're doing. And if they're standing in front of you, you're going to have a good idea how they're doing. But on a test question, you got to pull that information from the question. They have to give you this information. So is the patient stable? So does the patient come into your office and is, you know, it's a routine ECG and you find them in VTAC? Or are they unstable? Have they passed out and they're down someplace and you're at the mall and they're on the floor? And you come across this person uh, with people crowded around them who is basically unresponsive. If they have symptoms of VTAC and they notice them, but they're not so bad, is that something we need to know about? And then how often are they having these symptoms? These are all important questions before we go ahead and start giving them treatments, right? We need to know. I, we get this from patients a lot who say, you know, they come into the office and they say, I've got this problem, this problem, and this problem. 
and you want to send them for some tests, for some x-rays, for an echo or whatever. And then they say, in response to that, they say, hey, you know, is there anything, any way you can, you, you can treat the problem? And the answer is, I don't know what the problem is yet. So no, I can't start treating it yet. You need to have, I need to get some more information. I'm not going to start treating things at random. Uh, so these are some questions you need to know up front. Obviously, um, patient is pulseless and down, then the answer is going to be defibrillation. Okay, so you get a pulseless VTAC, the answer is defibrillator. You got to shock them back. Synchronized cardioversion is going to be another one. This is used for VTAC when a pulse is present. So if we have a pulse and the patient is in symptomatic VTAC, we can use synchronized cardioversion. But if they're asymptomatic, if they're not really having these same kind of issues, if they're tolerating it okay, uh, but having some complaints, then we're going to use more of a medical route with things like beta blockers. They talk about uh, sotalol a lot is the first one that comes up. Antiarrhythmics uh, like lidocaine and procainamide and amiodarone are also going to be used in these cases. Now, these can be used along with defibrillation uh, because we're trying to break them out of that arrhythmia. But you're going to use things like beta blockers and antiarrhythmics for patients who are having symptomatic VTAC. VTAC. Torsades de, de Puentes is our next one. Uh, it means turning of spikes, and that refers to how it looks on ECG. It looks like it's a rotating, spinning kind of rhythm. Again, this one should be, it can be tricky to pick out on ECG, but it should be pretty obvious. The big deal here is it can lead to sudden cardiac death. And obviously, that's something we want to avoid. The QRS complexes appear to twist around the isoelectric line because they are polymorphic. So that's the key here. You, if, the, if every QRS looks the same, you don't have torsades. It's a polymorphic VTAC, a specific type of polymorphic VTAC, but a polymorphic VTAC. So you're getting different um, different QRS complexes because it's all it's polymorphic and it looks like nice and smooth and spinning around that isoelectric line. Our treatment in this case is a bolus of magnesium. And then cardioversion is also an option, but it can be difficult uh, to, to match up the timing on that. So cardioversion can be a little bit hard to do, but it is an option. This should be one you should be able to pick out on ECG. Definitely look it up. Um, it's one you should totally get right. It's it's pretty straightforward to identify and then to treat. So it's it's a question you should not miss on your exam. Next, we have V-fib, ventricular fibrillation. Um, if you remember from our our chats a couple days uh, in recent episodes, uh, we talked about uh, AFib. In atrial fibrillation, you get this quivering of the heart muscles, right? Of in the in the atria where here it's just the same thing in the ventricles so the muscles are all contracting but all at different rates all at different points i mean you can think about it just in your biceps you've got you know what thousands of different muscle fibers in your bicep right it's not made up of one uh, one muscle fiber it's lots and lots of fibers creating a muscle well those muscles fire together when you think about curling in your your arm flexing your elbow those muscles all fire together those muscle fibers but what if they just decided on their own to fire independently whenever they wanted? You wouldn't get a good contraction of that whole muscle. You might get a little bit of a contraction of the muscle. It may be somewhat functional, but it's not going to work well. And that's what you've got here. You've got ventricular myocytes contracting without any coordination between each other. So different areas of the, uh, the ventricles just contracting on their own and sending out a signal for everyone else to contract. There's no effective movement of blood at this point, right? We talked about that with AFib. We give people... Uh, we worry about blood clots with AFib because the blood isn't actually, it's not moving well through the through the atria, right? So the blood tends to clot off because it's just kind of pooling in the atria. It's not moving through very well. In VFib, there's no movement of blood. It's just it's because the ventri ventricles are quivering. At least in AFib, the ventricles are contracting and they're pushing blood out and then that's opening up so they can refill with blood from above. So you are getting blood flow. It's just that some of it's getting trapped in the atria and not moving well. With VFib, there's no movement of blood. Risk factors here include coronary artery disease, history of MI, valve disease, and cardiomyopathy, basically cardiac history uh, of any kind. Uh, physical exam, these patients will not have a pulse. No pulse in V-fib, right? We just said there's no blood moving out. These patients are unresponsive, and they don't have normal breathing either. So this is somebody who goes down in the mall. Labs and studies, you're going to get your ECG. Again, no P wave wide QRS complex, except this time it's going to be very irregular, unformed QRS complexes. Like AFib, this can look kind of funny and be a little bit difficult to discern. 
uh, but the no pulse thing should help you in a test question. This requires immediate intervention and is necessary to prevent sudden death, right? No blood moving, patient's going to die. You have to intervene right away. And the first thing we do is defibrillate. That's the number one thing. We don't wait on anything for defibrillation. Now we have no pulse, so we're going to do CPR because that's going to help push the blood around. We don't wait on anything for a defibrillator. Again, we can use lidocaine, procainamide, or amiodarone, vasopressin to help along the way. That was lidocaine, procainamide, amiodarone, and vasopressin to help. But really what's going to save these people is a defibrillator. CPR will help them until you can get a defibrillator present, but it's the, fibr the, 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 the early defibrillation that's the key. Sweet. So that wraps up our ventricular arrhythmias. I actually just signed up for ACLS. I, I almost wish I'd been able to do this show after I had taken that course. Um, I'm sure I'll, add, I'll have more stories. Maybe I'll go back and revisit it at that point. Uh, I think I'm doing that in June or something. I don't know. I just sent out the check today. Um, but if if you have the opportunity to, and you need to get your ACLS done, before I did my panry last time, and maybe this will be my study tip for the day. Before I did my panry last time, I did that week, I took a day off and did my ACLS course. Uh, and at the time, I was going crazy. I was like, oh, you're such a moron. This is such a waste of time. I can't believe you're spending 10 hours in here. Uh, you could be studying, you could have taken the day off to study. That would have been so much more valuable. But I needed to do my ACLS anyway, right? The, the, for my job, it requires it. So I had to get it done. And having a setting where I was being tested on and had to practice this stuff right out in front of other people and go over it hands on and go through the medications, it really helped me a lot on my cardiology part of my panry. I, I, I know that I got at least two questions right on that exam directly from the doing my ACLS. So I think that's something that's valuable. Now, if you're graduating with your, um, from school and you don't need necessarily need your ACLS or in a job that doesn't need it, uh, it's questionable. But I think it was really helpful to be put into that situation just a couple of days before my exam and really forced me to go through the ECGs and go through the, the medications for that. So anywhere you can put yourself into that position that you have to use the material, that you have to stand up and walk around and use the material before an exam. I think it's incredibly helpful. We talk a lot about active versus passive, uh, studying how to incorporate more of your senses, how to incorporate your ears and, and even sights and smells and all kinds of things into what you're doing. I always think that that's incredibly helpful uh, just from recognizing uh, what page in a book something's on versus having the same monotony of the 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 books that you're using, but having the ACLS book, which is brightly colored and has nice alg algorithms in it. Having something like that, I think is incredibly helpful. So, you know, anytime you can take it outside of what you're, outside of your studies, outside of, of your desk, let's say, or outside of the same situation and, and apply that information and use it in a, in a different way, I, it goes a long way to help you. All right, so let's wrap that up there. That was enough <laughs> of my little soapbox for today. We'll talk about something else next week. Um, I had something I wanted to share, but you know what? I, I don't want to add on top of that right now. So I'll do that next week. Um, treatment for PVCs. What, what is the... Uh, let's, <laughs> I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about our post questions. What's the treatment for PVCs? A treatment for PVCs. They're asymptomatic. There is no treatment. How do you treat a pulseless VTAC? Pulseless VTAC. How do you treat a pulseless VTAC? Defibrillation. Now I want you to stop for what you're doing for just a second and think about what a multifocal PVC or a polymorphic PVC, what does that mean? What does it mean to be multifocal or polymorphic? It means that they originate at different places within the ventricles. And then the PVC QRS complexes are going to be different. That's the key to that. Okay. Great work. Okay, good. So that takes care of uh, ventricular arrhythmias. Next time we're going to be covering blocks. So, uh, all kinds of different blocks. We'll, we'll talk about that next week. It's something I always screw up and struggle with uh, remembering which one is which. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll get into that in great detail in the next session. 
uh, between now and then, if you have not already done so, head on over to the website, uh, check out what we've done over there, check out the notes, everything's listed there for you. Some people like to read along there as they go through the material. Uh, and while you're there, sign up for the email uh, group. It's I've, I've been sending out daily emails with tips and how to handle different test questions and how to cover different material and best practices for studying. Uh, definitely you want to get on that. I think that's been one of the most exciting things I've done here in a long time. Uh, so definitely head over to the website and check out uh, what I have to offer there. I also, it may not be functioning right now. I've tried to set it up. I'm having some technical issues uh, that you do definitely get the, the chapter one of the final step book. Uh, I'm not chapter one, the cardiology chapter of the final step book. When you sign up, if it isn't working, when you sign up, just let me know and I'll send that to you. Not a big deal. Uh, it's pretty easy for me to do, um, but I think it's working automatically. I will double check it and make sure this week and, and get out in front of that. But if you haven't done so good, definitely go over and check that out. I think the, the information there is incredibly valuable. Um, it goes hand in hand with what I do here on the podcast. This is the um, one part of it. The email system has been another part of it. And then the final step book is the third part. And they all kind of work in conjunction. Uh, and I think that all three together um, will make a huge impact on your exams and on your school, uh, on your end of rotation exams, on your pants, on your pan read. Uh, I would I strongly recommend uh, being a part of all three parts of the community at this point. Anyway, I'm going to go out and enjoy this sunny day. We may actually be able to get on the baseball fields today. They're pretty wet. I'm hoping uh, we can get out there and actually... Uh, have some fun. So uh, take care, good luck, and I will talk to you soon. Take care.